Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Camshaft and Crankshaft Ceiling Solutions. I am Amanda Harmoning, and I will be working behind the scenes today. Joining me are Rob Monroe and Chuck Lynch. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rob Monroe. I look after membership and technical development here with AERA. Uh, I'll be in the background today answering any questions you have during the webinar as well as Amanda, Chuck, and myself will be available afterwards to answer any questions you may have as well. Hello, and I'm Chuck Lynch. I am uh, one of the phone techs uh, that you'll uh, receive when you call in, and I will be your presenter today. All right, thanks guys. Before I hand things over to Chuck, I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping slides with you guys. First off, there are a couple different ways you can listen in to today's webinar. The first is to dial in via phone. Um, if you do this, please make sure you enter that audio pin in addition to your access code. This just allows your line to be muted so there's no background noise during the presentation. And the other way is to listen in with your computer's speakers. Um, again, make sure you select this option if this is how you're listening in. It just gives us muting controls. So. A couple other items in the control panel you should know about. First off, there's a grab tab. This is the little red box with the arrow in it. This allows you to collapse and expand your control panel when you're not using it so that you can have the full screen for the presentation. And the last item is the questions box. And if at any point during the presentation you have a question, go ahead and type it in this box. Um, we will be having a live Q&A at the end of the presentation, so if you don't get an answer from us before then, know that we will answer your question live. Um, at this time, if everyone can navigate out to the questions panel, just let me know where you're listening in from today. We've got members all over the world, so we're just kind of curious where everybody is listening from. And while you guys are answering, I'm just going to hand things over to Chuck here and let him get set up. All right, looks like we got people in Wyoming, Illinois, Nevada, Wisconsin, Florida, some people up in Canada, California, Minnesota, Michigan, Maryland, you guys are all over the place. Thank you everyone for answering and at this time I will hand things over to Rob and let him get going with the presentation. All right. Good morning, afternoon, or wherever you may be. Uh, again, my name is Chuck Lynch and uh, I'm a tech here at AERA and uh, recently did pretty much this presentation um, at our uh, first regional in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, so today as we cover crankshaft and, crank and uh, camshaft ceiling solutions, uh, we'll talk about parameters, some of the guidelines, and tips for proper seal function and reliability. Um, so the basics of a shaft seal, um, <clears throat> so you know, we always talk about you know, assemblies, modules, and so forth. Well, again, you know, with a with the shaft seal, there's quite a few components that go in it besides just the shaft. Um, you know, we have to consider the interaction, interrelationship between all of the components um, when discussing a true shaft seal. Um, once installed, um, a typical shaft seal is identified by two sealing criteria. The static seal is formed as a result of contact with the shaft surface as well as seals outside diameter to the housing bore while the shaft is not rotating. Um, how an engine is mounted in the application is um, is a good example. Marine engines, um, you know, sometimes they're, they're either leaning back quite a bit, or they can be completely vertical. So once the engine is sitting idle, um, that's an opportunity for oil to you know leak out to the atmosphere. Uh, dynamic, as you know, dynamic is uh, is active. Um, motion. 
So dynamic seals must provide a seal that keeps fluid from migrating to the atmosphere when the shaft is rotating. The balance is to have enough contact to maintain a seal without burning the sealing lip or spinning the seal in housing. And we'll get into some uh, other cautions about that further into the presentation. <clears throat> okay, as I opened with, you know, it's actually, you know, the seal is really a sealing system. So um, we'll hit on the, these uh, key points. Okay, so we have the seal, you know, the physical component of the crankshaft, camshaft, main shaft, output shaft, whatever that seal may be. <clears throat> we have the shaft. We have the housing bore. We have the installation process of the seal and the shaft or whatever it may be. Uh, the media to be sealed. In this instance, it's primarily going to be oil. And the environment and dynamics. Again, rotation, oscillation, um, environment, um, pressure, temperature, and so on. So um, shaft seal surface parameters. This is kind of the area that wanted to really um, kind of hit on. I mean, we've all installed seals, um, but oftentimes overlooked at the complexity of the requirements um, for the housing bore, the shaft, and so forth. So first, we'll hit on the shaft. <clears throat> so a plunge grind with no lead angle is extremely important for the shaft itself. So the image to the right there you'll see, that depicts um, a rudimentary and very effective method for testing lead angle. Um, there are optical devices out there that, that look at lead angle, but this is, you know, simply um, some wax dental floss and a weight. And you would rotate the shaft, and if the shaft, if that weighted um, device stays in place, um, you can pretty well rest assured that there's no lead. If it'll corkscrew its way in, you know, toward the shaft or out toward the seal, then then you have lead. And uh, again, this is a very simple method, but very effective method. Um, again, there are optical devices out there, and and uh, they can be quite pricey, but uh, you know, you can do this anywhere. Um, anybody can, you know, accomplish this. So. Weighted nut, as you see there, it's uh, using a fishing lure clasp and a sinker. <clears throat> Surface pinch parameters. Um, typically, most of us are using RA, um, but there are also parameters there for RZ. Um, RZ is a 10-point peak count, um, so it's a. This is actually a very good surface parameter for gasketing and so forth as well. And you see RPM, um, that is peaks above the mean line, and it's 20 to 50. All of these values I listed today in micro inch rather than do the conversions. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, if our members have any additional questions on that, um, you know, feel free to give us a call or shoot me an email, and uh, we'll do the conversions for you. Um, it is a little bit um, different, you know, when you're converting microns to micro inches. Sometimes, you know, your decimal locations will get a little goofy on you and you may not trust your uh, results. <clears throat> Total indicated run out. On a shaft with a diameter of less than four thousandths, no greater than five thousandths run out um, is kind of what's generally accepted. Shaft speed and seal type have bearing on this parameter. Um, you know, if you've got a PTFE, if you've got, a, you know, silicone, um, you know, polyacrylate, has it got a garter spring installed, all those things, um, you know, is a real high speed or real low speed. So, you know, those things have to be factored in there. But again, generally 5,000 is accepted for engines. <clears throat> Ideally, no nicks or scratching on the surface, especially where the seal lip would be in contact with the shaft. Most of us are in the remanufacturing industry, not the new assembly. So we often get 
shafts that are mis mishandled and so forth. And it's you know that's something you definitely want to pay attention to and look at. Hey, although I may have a ding or a nick or something, uh, it cannot be in the seal lip area. Um, seal surface should be clean and free of contaminants like dried soap, flash rust, or sealants. Um, sealants are probably one of the things that gets ignored the most. You know, you're putting uh, a seal in between main caps and so forth, or on a on the OD of a seal is being pressed into a housing, and that stuff ends up on the either the seal lip itself or on the the shaft face, and um, now you have an eccentric that's going to pump oil. All these parameters that I'm that I've listed are covered in the RMA handbook, and uh, many seal suppliers will share share that information, and it's also posted in a lot of their manuals. Um, in some cases, the manual have the whole. Um, amount of information. Sometimes they just have some um, topics that they cover, um, you know, some frequently asked question topics. Um, keep in mind, these are really for all shaft seals. It's not just engines. Um, so the, in, the information doesn't really change. There's, there'll be some charts for shaft speed and, you know, and trying to help you select the best seal for the application and so forth. Engines are typically a little bit more nailed down um, because of odd dimensions, but you know, if you get in some of the SAE dimension stuff, um, you can actually use, you know, shaft speeds and so forth to pick out the seal that you're looking for. Um, and again, this can be referred to when talking transmissions, differentials, electric motor seals, and so on. Um, shaft seal surface parameter on out of round. Now this condition is one that you would typically see on a crank flange surface, so you know, could help you kind of um, get to like root cause if you have a particular shaft that you know, hey, everything, my surface finishes are all good. Um, you know, I think my installation problem is, you know, or installation practice is is good, but I still have leaks with this particular engine type, and you know, like small block Ford, I know that there's like the 351, um, the distance from the bolt hole to the seal surface is pretty minimal. So you get in, you grind on that surface, you take away more material, you know, maybe someone puts a helicoil in to repair, a, you know, a damaged uh, threaded hole, and now you've upset the balance and you have an out around condition there. So, you know, torquing of the bolts um, can be, is very critical in some applications. And uh, so just some things you want to, you know, keep in mind. Um, again, you know, it's like you're trying to uh, actually seal over a, a square or a clover leaf rather than a round shaft. <clears throat> so we can get into the materials of the shaft. Um, shaft materials can be steel, stainless steel, wrought iron, and uh, some cast irons. Um, we generically use cast iron um, you know, all things with engines, but typically your crankshaft cast irons are of higher ductility, harder materials, or a better alloy than, than say, a, a head casting or a block cast. Um, the shaft should not be plated. Now, this causes a little bit of uh, controversy because there's there are some plated repair sleeves that grow that go on the shafts, but um, you know that's uh, that's you know different to the industry, and certain types of seals are run against those. But by and large, it is not recommended that you you know take a shaft and plate it on a surface that's going to be running against what was the original di design seal. Um, if that material starts to abrade or come loose, it can really um, tear the seal up in very short order. Um, preferred hardness is a minimum of 30. Rockwell C. Um, most of the shafts you're going to see are more in the neighbor of, neighborhood of uh, 40 to 50. Uh, the on the repair sleeves that I was talking about, they're very thin wall. Um, they'll have a Rockwell B of 75 to 80. Um, they're spring steel to ensure that they uh, stay on the shaft, so they're very thin walled. Um, 
knurled seal surfaces. <clears throat> it's one of those things if you were to talk to a, you know, a seal design engineer, they would probably say, well, we don't recommend that. But the reality of it is when you're talking with uh, you know, our industry, we still have folks that are rebuilding old engines that have knurled seal surfaces. So some things of caution um, if you have to recondition these, and which is getting more difficult to find tooling to even knurl a shaft if it does need to be re-knurled, um, do not overlap the knurl. Um, what happens, you know, that knurl is di displacing a certain volume. Um, it, these things work like an Archimedes pump. So if you overlap, you're most likely not going to hit that, that first groove or channel that you made in exactly the same place. So now you start upsetting the balance of how many uh, knurling flutes, the depth, um, how much, you know, for every action there's a reaction. So you're going to push material out that uh, you may not be able to polish back down leading into, okay, once you knurl the shaft, you do need to, to uh, polish the crank to remove the high spots created by the knurling process. And this is a highly critical <laughs> component here would be knowing the crankshaft rotation um, as it would turn in the engine. Um, if you don't match the knurl with the crankshaft rotation within the engine, um, now you're going to be trying to pump your oil out of the engine. There's a fine balance you need to keep. It will, it will pump oil to the seal to the point that, you know, it, it shouldn't burn up the interface. So there will be some oil at that interface all the time. But really, it's trying to pull the oil back to the crankcase. And, uh, you know, so if, you, if your neural's the wrong direction, well, it's going to go over the atmosphere. <clears throat> Shaft chamfer or radius. Uh, is really there's one purpose, and that's to get that shaft seal lip started over the shaft. Um, you know, if you could produce a radius on those, it would be ideal. Um, from manufacturing standpoint, is much cheaper to cut a chamfer than it is to machine a radius. Um, with the CNC world now and manufacturing new shafts. Maybe not so much, but anybody that has to address this is probably going to throw these in a crank lathe or something and and uh, just quick cut a chamfer rather than make a radius. Um, variation in the shaft diameter um, to ensure that you have optimum contact with the shaft seal. Um, as you can see, there's a little table there. Again, um, for any of the members that would want to call in, we could be more than happy to share the RMA information or talk to your seal manufacturer and, and then share, share that information as well. But you see the tolerance is based on shaft diameter. So the ones that we would be working on most commonly are going to be in that neighborhood of two to four thousandths. And the area on the shaft for the seal lip interference should be in a tolerance of uh, plus or minus three thousandths. And I can tell you that in the industry, a lot of folks actually use that spec at the very bottom of about plus or minus five thousandths on a seal surface. Uh, we do have a very accommodating industry that tries to build seals for engines that work with that that particular tolerance of plus or minus five thousandths on on seal surface diameter. Again, if you go by the general rules across the seal industry, um, you should really be at you know plus or minus three thou. <clears throat> Here's some seal bore parameters. Um, this would be you know your housing. Um, so again, um, this this presentation will be um, on our um, home site. If you were want to look at these slides at a later date as well and grab some more of this information, or again, you know, give us a buzz or shoot us an email and we'll share this with you. But you'll see based on the seal type, um, you know, the housing bores, what the you know interferences should be um, in the housing and so forth. As you can see, there's a, you know, like steel bore, aluminum bore, all that information's uh, kind of compiled there. Um, some typical seal design comparisons. Um, you know, quite honestly, today um, the PTFE laydown design is, by and large, the most popular. Um, 
the elastomeric seal design is, is extremely popular too. You can see the garter spring on the back side of that um, where it's actually contacting the, the interface. That's what controls the point load on the seal surface. The PTFE, you can kind of see where they're, um, each little channel is, uh, is cut into that seal surface. Um, there's a, a cutting action and it's actually a spiral. So those things in reality um, actually have a lead that could migrate oil all the way out. Um, but what they do is condition themselves to the shaft, which we'll see here further in an upcoming slide. Um, these are some of the pressure distributions. Um, so as we've torn down engines, I'm sure everybody's noticed that amazingly how deep some of the grooves can be worn when it's had a, you know, a rubber seal running against that shaft. And you see, you know, as you start to uh, get carbon deposits in the, the buildup at that interface, you know, temperature of you know hot cold hot cold as the engine thermal cycles and, and carbon build up you get some hard particles that actually build at the interface there and they will even um, wear that seal lip into the shaft more um, as you can see with the ptfe design it distributes that load across a much greater surface and um, will cause less wear on the shaft over time here's the uh, slide that i was referring to on the conditioning of the seal into the shaft. Um, so this is um, very much why you do not want typically to put lubrication on a PTFC, PTFE seal. Uh, you want it to give it the opportunity to run against that surface finish that we were talking about earlier of 10 to 25 RA. Um, so there, you know, many times what happens is the shaft seal surfaces get polished the same as the journals. And what that does is makes it, you know, difficult or impossible for the seal to actually condition itself to that surface. And it will stand up on the oil and you may have immediate leaks because um, you're not going to have the opportunity to condition that seal lip with that shaft. So again, you can see before and after the air gap that's between the sealing lip and the shaft and the point at where the Teflon has actually laid itself into the shaft and become a conditioned unit. <clears throat> Installation, um, this is where most of the issues really come from. You know, we can say, well, that, that shaft or that seal is, you know, poor quality or whatever, you know, and that's probably where most of the the uh, blame comes from, but quite honestly, you know, if you got your uh, concentricity is good, seal surfaces are good, things of that nature, this is the biggest area that we're probably faulting on with the installation of, of shaft seals. <clears throat> so I'm sure you have the correct type of drivers, um, seal type and design will dictate the type of installer. Many of the installers now are actually, you know, a pressing type device. So you may, you know, put it on an arbor press and press the seal into a housing within the shop. Or if you're doing in vehicle repairs, you know, it's some kind of deal. You, you use your crankshaft adapter, um, you know, for the flywheel, and you will press the seal into the housing to ensure that it's square. And uh, the seal supplier typically advise, you know, that per application. If you're doing the in vehicle installation stuff, you know, OTC and folks like that, they, uh, they typically have um, all of the more current devices. Uh, if you get in some of the older designs in the RMA handbook, they'll actually have um, some sketches on seal installation tooling, um, kind of some general parameters around how to build some of this tooling in the house. Um, crank chamfer is not bird. Um, this is really only relevant to uh, your one-piece seals, you know, that have to be driven over the end of the shaft. You know, two-piece seals, um, it's not so much of an issue. Um, seal installed squarely. 
again that's that's the the biggest issue that we would um, expect to have with crankshaft seals um, direction of rotation for installing the seal um, as I was talking about earlier on the neural shafts um, crankshafts no longer have the neural because the flutes as I referred to are are now part of the molding procedure of the shaft seal. Um, some of these are bi-directional if you look at like a shaft seal that would be used on a uh, you know axle shaft or the yoke going into a differential they actually have a cross hatchet on those because you're going to see rotation in both directions. Um, <clears throat> but again if you don't know the rotation of the engine and if that seal is to be applied for that direction rotation, it could um, result in immediate leakage. The installation of the seal in the housing, sometimes that can be very misleading. Um, you have a metal clad seal that looks like it's got, by and large, the garter spring and the opening goes in toward the engine but there are applications where that's actually turned out and then you would install a dust shield behind the seal. Um, so again, you need to make sure and look at the markings and say, okay, you know, so in those applications, they'll usually say this side out, um, you know, so that you, you don't put the seal in backwards, but that is something to be aware of. Um, know when to use lubrication or sealant, um, you know, parting lines of blocks and if you're you know like big block Chevys or you know many early applications instead of having a bolt on um, seal housing uh, they machined the back of the block so it's still a pressed in one piece seal but you could have what appears to be an oil leak because of migration between um, the main cap and the seal housing. <clears throat> on installation, the OD, you may want to use a lubricant to reduce installation load. Um, engine oil um, is a good alternative, but the app, just be cautious because if the OD is coated with a, like a silicon um, or an elastomer, sometimes if you have a Viton seal, it may have the Viton lip and it's all molded together and the Viton is even on the outside of the seal casing. If you get oil on that, again, upsetting that balance we were talking about for the dynamic seals, um, it could then spin in the housing. But more often than not, the when you upset the, um, you have little grooves that are in the OD seal and you put oil in there. So now you've increased the press fit. So it's going to take the path of least resistance. Um, so if you got oil on the output of that, on the outside of that elastomer, it may cause that seal to pop back out shortly after being installed. Um, just, you know, that's just the reaction of lubricants against, uh, you know, the rubber type products. Uh, they get very slippery. That's why, you know, oil pan gaskets, the molded rubber ones, um, got to be cautious about spraying on, um, you know, spray adhesives or getting oil on those surfaces and they want to squirt out between um, the bolts that retain them. <clears throat> so preferred application is uh, to apply, say if you do have a metal clad seal and you can apply lubricant or um, you know a press fit lube, something like that, is to put that in the bore and when you drive your seal in, it's going to push the lubrication in toward the engine. Um, rather than it run all down the back and then you have a, you know, you mistake that for leakage. Um, <clears throat> use a sealant if in the bore, um, if there's damages or scratches to exceed two or three thousandths in depth. So basically, if you can fill it with your nail, um, you should probably try to address that scratch. Whether you use a flange gasket eliminator is a good option. Um, or if you were to, you know, fill that with some epoxy and then take it back out, 
um, leaving just the area that was filled. Um, you know, those are good options. Um, ensure that the excess is, if you are using like a flange gasket eliminator or whatever, um, be very aware of where the excess did go. Um, you do not want that stuff curing on the shaft, curing on the seal lip. Um, that's a, it's going to be a pretty quick seal leak. The seal lip, um, if it's an elastomeric seal, apply a few drops of oil to the shaft or whatever forces the lubricants go into the crankcase rather than outward, again, as it appeared to be a leak. Um, PTFE, Teflon lay down lip seals, lubricant is not necessary. Um, we are in the business of building engines, so the presence of a small, you know, little bit of lube from your, you know, having oil on your fingers and whatnot, that's not the end of the world. Um, but, you know, you don't purposely put oil there and, or it will cause the seal to not condition itself to the shaft. Um, here's some illustrations, examples of, uh, you know, good and, and bad installation. You know, quite honestly, if you've got a seal housing and you see in that upper left-hand corner, you know, it shows that's correct because everything is nice and square. You know, don't beat on the seal directly. Use the, you know, your tooling, an arbor or whatever to get that seal started. But if you have the opportunity, you know, an arbor press is a much better option than, uh, than whacking on with a hammer. Um, there's just so much variation in load force with a hammer than, you know, if you're using an arbor. So sometimes you can't feel um, if, you, you know, if it's starting to, to get a crooked and off to one side. And it doesn't take a whole lot, you know, a 20, you know, 29 gauge piece of steel cladding, um, you can distort that pretty easily. Again, um, this, this webinar will be saved and, and you can take a look at these illustrations later or give us a call. Environmental influences, fluid volume, temperature, pressure in the crankcase, um, lubrication type, and my experience in conversations with uh, seal designers, they state that one of the biggest challenges to them annually is, hey, do we have materials that are going to play nice with the additive packs that are being required in, um, you know, to meet EPA standards and so forth. And then you have, you know, the uh, performance oil companies and out, out there and whatnot that, uh, that are constantly looking to improve their packages as well. So those can have a bearing on, on the, you know, the longevity of a seal um, if it doesn't play well with the material. Now, PTFE is pretty much inert to most of the things it's been associated with. Again, it does have the, the flutes in it, so it may not be the best option for, say, a water pump seal, but, um, you know, they can actually leak air. They can leak uh, low viscous fluids, but um, they are pretty much inert to, you know, chemical packages. Um, again, Contamination such as sealants um, at assembly and, um, you know, just poor handling. You know, I should have washed my hands. I had grit blast on my hands and then it touches the oil and now all that nastiness is on the shaft and it makes it impossible for the uh, shaft seal to uh, break in against the shaft. <clears throat> so, um, that kind of concludes the slides, and we've left some time to um, answer questions um, regarding maybe any of your particular applications. And again, um, this information would be more than happy to, uh, you know, expand on um, per application. Um, again, from the RMA handbook, and uh, you know, our relationship with the parts manufacturers, and and we can get uh, more of this information um, to you. All right, thanks, Chuck. We had a couple questions come in here for you.
Uh, first no. off, we had a question come in. Um, when using a RMS repair sleeve in general, would you recommend grinding the crank and installing the sleeve that would maintain the original OD? As a matter of fact, there are, there's two schools of thought there. Um, in some cases, the seal manufacturer will say, this is you know, considered like a thick wall repair, and you will have to grind the shaft. In many of the cases, though, they've taken that into consideration, and you drive it over the end of the shaft, so it drives right over the wear area, and um, you use it as is. So you probably really should ask the supplier for that detail first. Um, again, because they are both out there. Some of those, you know, again, are more of a thick wall, and that surface is, you know, providing the strength, it's providing the surface finish, and it's probably, you know, going to be the standard dimension ID on the seal, whereas the thin walls are not this, that same dimension. I hope that answers it correctly. All right. And then another question we had was, should synthetic oil be on the seal lip? If synthetic was required, um, a good example was when Mobile One came out and, you know, the Corvette engines, well, they were put together around the whole premise that they were going to be using Mobile One. Now, if you're not in a situation where the, the service manual called out that specific oil, then I typically the answer is going to be no for synthetics. Um, so ideally, look at your service manual um, and you know your petroleum-based oils are you know are always safe, and to go with something like that rather than go with a synthetic, and again unless it is specifically spelled out. Um, in service information for that particular application. All right. Um, another question was, um, what is the proper installation of an anti burning The proper installation um, of PTFE seals. Sorry, could you repeat that one? Um, well, let got to answer your question here, and then I'll go back to that one. All right. I can help you out. Um, I can help you out there a bit, Amanda. Um, okay. Yeah, Scott, um, Scott's got a question for you, Chuck. He wants to know, what's the proper installation of a two-piece seal at the parting line? <clears throat> well, typically you would say, offset it somewhere between an eighth and three eighths at the parting line. Um, rotate the seal so that it, it does not match with the parting line. But if you take like the four liter Jeep, um, they have little wings that snap into the block so it does not give you the opportunity to offset. Um, so sometimes you're kind of hand-tied in, in regards to the offset, but um, you'll read many articles that'll state, you know, ideally try to do a little bit of an offset. Okay. Um, another question's come in. Uh, Benjamin's got another question. If the crank has a knurl, could you grind it off and leave it off, still using the regular rear main seal? You know, if you get into situations where you grind that off and leave it off, you probably want to consult with your seal supplier to make sure that you have enough interference for that seal design. Um, as far as being successful with uh, no neural there, and there's no neural on the seal, okay, everything leads to no, you should not do that, but I do know that it does happen, um, you know, in conversation with the folks that are doing, you know, enough volume to say, hey, it does or it does not work. Um, if it's a one-off kind of deal, it's a little bit risky. 
Um, but again, you know, some of the folks that are doing these uh, in production capacities are saying, hey, I've done it and it works well. I get, you know, surface finish is good, diameter control is good. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit hard to, ha to answer that question, but the reality of the world that we live in today is, okay, there's shafts that were knurled. There's no seal that actually fits the standard of no knurl on the shaft and no knurl on the seal lip. Okay, we've got another question that came in for you, Chuck. Uh, Scott also has a question. Is hard chrome an okay sealing surface on a shaft? <clears throat> hard chrome is a classification that means that it's going to be, you know, in measurable in, you know, one and a half thousandths and greater um, to that diameter. Again, ideally, and this is, you know, I'm just quoting what come out of the RMA handbook, um, is that seal surfaces should not be run on chrome. Um, reality of it is, um, you know, there's an aftermarket sleeve company that they chrome plate their sleeves, and I think they've been very successful with it. The big concern there is when you stretch it and you may fracture that chrome. Um, chrome actually will give an a a surface that is is kind of nodular. It has dimples like a golf ball. So there's not a real controlled path. Like when you grind, um, you you know, there's so many counts of chatter or lobing um, over a given surface. Um, so if you look at chrome, it really exceeds the lobing count. And again, it's not a true defined directional surface. Again, it's like a golf ball. So, you know, you may find a seal that just works with it and, and that's fine. But if you were to say, hey, by the written rule, uh, it would not be advisable. Okay. Uh, Tony's got a question for you. How much crush would be recommended on a typical rear seal with a diameter of two and a half inch when converting from rope to lip seal. So when you're yeah converting from a rope to a lip seal, the the cross-sectional area of it really kind of controls that. So the the manufacturer, see some of those have like a, a steel spring wire that's installed and then you know the Oldsmobiles, Pontiacs and stuff, that one's pretty thin. Um, AMCs are pretty thin. You get into some of the, you know, the early replacement Fords, they're really narrow. So their, their standout above the cap is only 10 or 15 thousandths, and you get into some of the narrow ones, and they will be at about 40 thousandths. So it's for the, for the answer to that, it's a little bit tough because, again, it's, you know, the width um, from, you know, front to rear, and the cross section from the ID to OD, if that makes sense, is going to have an impact on it. You know, you can displace more. That's just like an engine bearing. Um, a narrow engine bearing is probably going to have a little bit more crush height than a big, heavy duty wide bearing that doesn't distort as much. All right. Here's another one for you. Um, seals and using a glycol-based oil, like industrial applications, for example, is there any special considerations there? <clears throat> if you can use Phyton, do it. Um, if it's an option, um, your polyacrylates, um, you know, like the glycol-based stuff or the silicone-based stuff would, you know, would be used in oftentimes, uh, you know, brake systems and, and so forth. Uh, Viton's pretty inert to that kind of stuff. Polyacrylate, um, butyl, those types of seals, although they'll work for a short period of time, um, again, you're just you're degrading the life of the seal by choosing those uh, particular ma materials. Now, were they used early on when the engine was designed? Very possibly, um, but you know, Viton, um, 
or Flora Elastomer, you know, Viton is a registered trademark name. Um, so those materials are relatively new um, to us, even though they're still 25, 30 years old now. Um, yeah, I mean, anytime you have the opportunity to, to, uh, to apply Viton, it's definitely the best option. All right, another question for you, Chuck. Um, would you use those same tolerances when considering um, when considering bearings, either cam or crank? So it must be referring to maybe the tolerances to that, that sheet that you had up on the screen before. But yeah, I just mentioned, would you use those same tolerances when considering bearings, either cam or crank? Absolutely, yes. Those, the housing bores, diameters. Um, again, the one thing that you will probably want to take a look at is the speed at which the shaft would turn if you're going to try to find an optional seal. But yeah, the housing bore diameters, those interferences, um, most definitely. And some place that this can kind of impact you is if your cleaning procedures are thermal. So if you get the those housings too high um, in a thermal cleaning process, you can really distort those and and that's where you really want to take a look at the outer round, the interference on the OD, the, the seal, and so forth. Um, so, yeah, again, as I stated, you know, during the presentation, the nice thing about this, um, these RMA standards, they apply whether it's an electric motor, camshaft, crankshaft, <clears throat> output shafts, yokes, whatever. And again, it does call out, you know, different, some different specifications for steel or aluminum. There is some variation there. All right, we've got another question that came in for you, Chuck. When installing a rear main seal having a retainer housing, would you recommend lubrication or sealant? If it's metal clad and it has like Many times the metal clad seals have paint, and that's supposed to act as your sealant. <clears throat> Sometimes the interference is so high you can hardly get those in, and you can use a press fit lube or a light oil. Um, again, if it's a rubber coated OD seal, um, I would avoid lubrication. Um, but again, whether you're pressing it into a housing or you're pressing it directly into the block casting, um, the rules should be the same. Um, again, the ones that are painted red and green and blue and whatever, that that paint, um, as anybody's probably looked at it, it's fairly heavy considering the, the gauge of steel it's applied on. And so that is acting as a press fit lubricant, as a sealant, um, and should help you with the install. They do everything they can to try to keep you from having to apply stuff. Okay, well that looks like to be about all the questions that have come in from everybody. I'll uh, I'll go back over to Amanda to uh, to help wind things up. All right, thank you everybody for attending. You will see a survey pop up when you leave today's webinar. Please take a moment and fill it out. Let us know how we did. If you have any additional questions? Anything you'd like to see in the future? Um, you will also get a follow-up email tomorrow from us, and this will contain a link to a recording of today's webinar. You can share it, watch it again, refer to it at your leisure. Um, and then also, you'll see at the bottom, I have listed our contact information. You can reach anyone at AERA by calling the phone number listed there, 815-526-7600. And then I have also listed Chuck's email, Rob's email, as well as my email. Um, you can also hit reply at any email you get and go to webinar and they'll just come back to me and I will send them on to the appropriate person. So thank you again for joining us and we hope the webinar was helpful. Everyone have a good day.